Well, good morning. If you weren't here for the beginning of our service this morning, and if you are visiting with us, I am not the regular preacher. Our regular preacher, Sean Jeffries, is out of town conducting a gospel meeting in the, in the Indianapolis, uh, Indiana area. So there are several of us filling in for him in the auditorium this morning. I'm going to start this lesson out by putting a list before you of biblical people that are named in the Bible. And in a couple instances, there are even some groups of people that are named. But I want you to know that all of those that I will show you on the list have something in common with each other. And it is this commonality that existed among this list of people, as recorded in the Bible, that I wish to both share and examine with you this morning. And here is the list. Quite a list, isn't it? How would you like to have your name included on that list? You see, our name should and can be added to this list because of what the Bible reveals that all of those on this list had in common with each other. And even though the people on this list did not live on earth in the same time frame with each other, despite that fact, they still shared something in common with each other. And that commonality is this. They are all referred to in the Bible as having been servants of God. Later in the New Testament times, they were referred to not only as servants of God, but also as servants of Christ. Now, I can add to this list the scriptures that you see here that show and state this commonality of being a servant of God. And in many cases, the declaration of being declared a servant was made directly by God himself. In other words, God observed them, he titled them, and he voiced them as his servants. Here's a key question. If we individually would like to see our name listed with those on this list, do you truthfully see yourself as a good and faithful servant of God and a servant of Jesus as they were. Well, let us look into deeper into the text that was read by Brother Josh this morning. Turn with me again, if you will, to Luke chapter 17. And once again, we're going to read there verses 7 through 10. Luke 17, verses 7 through 10. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping the sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Jesus had just spoken to his disciples about great works possible by great faith. And here, Jesus added some words meant to work against the pride that often rises up when someone is being used by God. And Jesus speaks here of what it really means to serve. You see, plowing was hard work. It exhausts the strength and endurance of the plowman. Not like today where a John Deere or a Case tractor has the cab that's all enclosed. It's air conditioned in there. They sit on the plushest seat that has a hydraulic actuator that takes out every bump in the field. They probably even can turn into Sirius and listen to the music that they want to hear. No, it wasn't so in the time that Jesus is talking about plowing the field. It was hard work to farm. And Jesus here is pointing out that it's also hard work 
in working the spiritual field. And tending sheep can also be hard work. It requires a lot of patience. It requires giving attention to detail. And of course, it needs for a caring heart. In this parable, Jesus points out that the servant had been working all day, either plowing the master's field or tending to his sheep. And when he came in at the end of his day, after this hard work, the master does not tell him, sit down to a fully prepared meal prepared for him. No, instead he orders him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink. The master does not compliment or feed or serve or massage the servant after coming in from the field or the pasture. Instead, the master expected the servant to keep serving because there was still work needing to be done as determined by the master. The point of the parable is this, that there is always something to do to serve our master, and there is always some way we can do it. Know this, these works are hard. But in this mini parable, Jesus gave us the right attitude that must be had in doing this work. And namely this, the master's pleasure comes before our own. The master's people are to be preferred before ourselves. And the master's name is placed before our own name. And so we see here a true servant of Christ has no reason No reason whatsoever to become prideful, feeling like we or our individual needs are what is most important. Self-importance needs to be plucked out by its roots, and in its place, there has to be a true, heartfelt, deep sense of personal unworthiness. Note that Jesus asked his disciples, listening to this parable, Does he, that is, does the master thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? Of course, the master does not thank the servant for such things. In that pre-Christian culture, such kindness was absolutely unthinkable. And please understand that Jesus is not, however, encouraging anyone to become inconsiderate or just outright rude. But I hope none of us here today believe that one's service to Jesus individually and inwardly demands that he must thank us or praise us. It seems strange that Jesus would thank us in light of all that he has done for us. It seems strange that he would thank us considering all that we have left undone. It seems strange considering all that we have done has come as a gift from him. Yet, strangely enough, he will thank us and he will reward us. And though we don't deserve it, he will look at the work of each of his servants and to the faithful ones, he will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. And the key point of this parable is to provide a vivid example to illustrate the point of verse 10. Namely, that we are unworthy servants. We must not be like the tax gatherer that will be displayed later in Luke chapter 18. But the tax collector stood by, far off, while not even lifting up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And we must not be like the Pharisee, who considered himself to be a religious man, who, standing by himself, prayed this way, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. In other words, he was saying, I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner like other men. 
And truthfully, he needed to have the very same understanding of himself that was exactly like what the tax collector had for himself. And Christians need to acknowledge that God owes us nothing, owes us nothing, and that we owe him everything, even our own lives. And that very thought is implied by Paul's message to the Christians at Corinth, who had become haughty and divisive in their words and actions by asking them this, as recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Have we, like the Corinthians, forgotten that our, our abilities, our opportunities, and that our blessings are from God? That question, what do you have that you did not receive? is a question that should be consistently and frequently repeated to ourselves. Because the fundamental and the essential thing that we have received is the forgiveness of our sins. And that should cause us to react in the same way, in the same manner as that tax collector. A true servant of God and of Christ sees themselves belonging to them in spirit and soul and body. In light of Jesus' death on the cross, there is nothing, absolutely nothing that one can ever do for Christ that will suffice or recompense him for what he has done for us. Even if we have done everything that has been commanded in the New Testament, we must still admit that we are an unworthy servant who has only done what was our duty to do. That's what Luke, chapter 17 of verse 10, is wanting us to see and fully comprehend, that we are unworthy servants doing what is our duty. Those on this list were deemed as servants of God. And subsequently then, they should serve as our examples of how we as Christians should serve the Lord. That begs some questions. What can we learn from them? What characteristics did they display that we can adopt to be considered a good and faithful servant of God? Before we look at answers to those questions, I want us to see something that Jesus stated to his 12 disciples. After the mother of the sons of thunder, that is the sons of Zebedee, James and John, came to him with her two sons and asked Jesus that they be given key positions in Jesus' kingdom, a kingdom yet to come, and one that she had not yet come to fully understand the nature of it. So after gathering the twelve before him, he stated to them this as recorded in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 27. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. And Jesus here makes a phenomenal statement concerning greatness in his kingdom. The Gentiles thought of greatness in terms of mastery and rule. However, in Christ's kingdom, greatness here revealed by Jesus himself is manifested by service. Whoever aspires to become great must become a servant. And whoever desires to be first must become a slave. And I believe here also that Jesus distinguishes that there's a difference between a servant and a slave. A servant was a hired worker who was hired to maintain the master's household. And a slave was someone that was forced into service. But I want you to know this, 
that those two positions were the two lowest positions that could be held by anyone in Jewish society. Even today, the concept of being considered a servant or a slave is despicable, and it's not acceptable in today's society. But servants of God, we must be. The specific ways in which one can serve will differ in time, it will differ in place, it will differ in position. And that brings us back to the questions. What can we learn from those listed as servants in the Bible? What characteristics did they display that we can adopt to also be considered a good and faithful servant of God? Characteristics that all of those on our list possess, with the most significant name on that list being the name of Jesus. I feel there are seven characteristics displayed in one form or another. Seven characteristics that are taught in the Word of God and need to be held by a Christian. These seven characteristics can be ours if we choose to adopt them and make them become part of who we are, servants of God. And the first of these characteristics is that first, a servant is humble. The Apostle Paul taught this to the Christians in Philippi when he said, humility, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Look to the interests of others. Take the form of a servant. Be humbled by becoming obedient. That's a summation of those verses before you. And just before his death, Jesus decided to give his followers a clear picture of this characteristic of humility. He took off his outer garments, he got a basin, and he washed their feet. Twelve pairs of feet Jesus washed that belonged to hairy men who walked on rough roads shared with all manner of livestock in a time when regular road cleaning was not had or daily showers were not common. Cleaning them would be the job of a servant and a lowly one at that. The disciples resisted the idea that their master and teacher would stoop to such a thankless task. But Jesus persisted and he said this to them, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If Jesus humbled himself in this way and even further in his death, then we also should be humble in all that we do for him and for others. The second characteristic is that a servant prepares. The Apostle Paul gave this advice to Timothy when he told him in this verse, train yourself. Practice what you have been taught. Immerse yourself in God's word. When you're hiring someone to make some important repairs or improvements for your home or your car, you want someone who has spent hours learning and perfecting their craft and is respected in their field. You wouldn't take on someone with no experience. However, that's exactly what Jesus did. He took on complete novices with no real experience in the work of God whatsoever. And provisionally through scripture, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the work and the effort of the church, God offers to us on-the-job training as well. And that's why it's essential that everyone be here when we assemble and allow ourselves to be fully trained and equipped to be godly and righteous in an ungodly and an unrighteous world. Jesus completed the work of salvation on us, on the cross for us, brings us into that salvation. 
gives us the Holy Spirit as our counselor and sets us about his business. He has finished the work of our salvation, but he still calls us to work in his kingdom. And therefore, with gratitude and love, we need to continually be trained to enable us to be the most effective servant possible. The third characteristic is that a a servant perseveres. Jesus alluded to the need for the perseverance in Luke chapter 12, when he said, be like men who are waiting for their master, and when he comes in, be ready. Servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. The work we've been given is long and tiring, sees little thanks or recognition, and may seem to count for little while it's being done, because it's most likely going to be rejected. And truthfully, performing such work is a challenge that none of us is up to on our own. We're not on our own. The master gives us each other to work beside one another, a glorious future to work toward, and a promise that our work will not be in vain. And most importantly, he gives us himself. His word is working in us and through us so that we can truly be ready for when he returns. The fourth characteristic is that a servant serves where needed. Jesus walked hundreds of miles. He likely often slept on the ground. He was pawed at by people. He got dirty. He sweated. He had to deal with the bickering among his co-workers. And he washed his followers' grimy, smelly, dirty feet. He did what was needed to advance the gospel. While pursuing that end, there was no task that was beneath him. And likewise, the apostle Apostle Paul placed no limits to his willingness to serve. Whether that meant going abroad to teach and to preach, or going into a not-so-nice part of town to make a visit, or giving up free time to help another, even if all he could do was provide some guidance in a letter that he would write, even if it involved being beaten, even if it involved being scoffed at, even if it involved being ridiculed, even if it involved being put in prison for his faith. And fifth, a servant serves, or not, as God directs, a point that is emphasized there in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. David wanted to serve. He wanted to honor God by building him a wonderful and a permanent home. And he drew up building schematics. He made plans for every detail of the temple and even talked to the priests and the Levites to make sure that everyone was on the same page. And even with all that preparation that he had done and all the other ways that he had served God, 1 Chronicles chapter 28 shows that the Lord did not allow David to build the temple. It was directed for Solomon to be built, to build it, and David's son to do the building. David, as God's obedient servant, accepted that idea and made it as much ready for Solomon as he could make possible. And sometimes the Lord says no to our plans to serve. Maybe there's someone more qualified. Or maybe because we're already serving in other places. And maybe we don't know why, but we trust God and we obey him knowing that. And sixth is a servant expects to suffer. Jesus taught this characteristic in the scripture you see there before you. He said, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? As Jesus' light shines through us, people who love darkness will become convicted and they're going to become uncomfortable in the light of his glory that we display. And they will subsequently hate us and they will ridicule us. If we truly seek to serve Jesus, it's only a matter of time before we must share in a portion of his suffering. But we take heart that someday, Jesus will stand in victory, and we who acknowledge him before men are going to be there standing with him. And the seventh characteristic is this. A servant is not ashamed. Another point that Paul made to Timothy, 
He said, do your best to present yourself to God, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. The work that we do, we do for Jesus by the Father's command and through the power of his Holy Spirit. We have the privilege to carry the gospel, the good news that Jesus, the long-awaited priestly king of Israel, has been victorious over death. And he will eventually destroy sin and death, and he'll bring all things, all things, under God's rule. It's a joyous work that we have been given, and we look to the day when our master returns and says to each one of us, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of of your master. Well, there we have it. Seven characteristics displayed and demonstrated in the lives of all those who listed. Most of them on this list did very well. Others not so very well, like King Nebuchadnezzar. And in some instances, God had to come into their lives and shake them up a bit to make them see what needed to be seen. But there's one name on that list, and that name is Jesus. It is he who we emulate to copy. He displayed all seven of these characteristics. The Apostle Peter, in writing to scattered Christians throughout the world at the time, stated this to them, as recorded in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 16. He told them all, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. As applicable as it was to those who were addressed in Peter's letter, it remains applicable to us today to live as servants of God, utilizing the seven characteristics that we saw listed. I think we all look forward to being in heaven, and once there, the book of Revelation reveals this. That from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God and all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. What a wonderful insight to the eternal glory to be experienced in heaven by God's servants. My friend, are you seeing yourself this morning as a servant of God, as a servant of Christ? Are the seven characteristics that We just saw of a good servant your characteristics. They can be, but if you're here this morning and have not obeyed the call of the gospel, and you see the need for yourself to become a servant of God, then won't you come as we stand and sing an invitation song?